Hi everyone, I'm Lisa Granshaw, an editor here at Backstage, and thank you so much for joining us as part of our Backstage Live programming via the Slate. As you all know by now, the Slate is our ongoing video series that you can watch from anywhere, featuring Instagram takeovers, Q&As, uh, live stream seminars, and more to learn all you need to know about the craft and business of acting. And so please, if you wanna check out our archives, take a look at our schedule, visit backstage.com to find out more information. And I am thrilled that today we're going to be joined by voice actor, Sarah Nedicheni. Uh, she is probably best known to you guys as the voice of Ash Ketchum on Pokemon. She of course does a number of other voices on the show as well and worked on many other great shows, films, and video games. So let's get Sarah in here to talk to us a bit about her career, her voice acting. All right. Ice as well. Waiting to connect a little bit. We'll talk to her about her work on Pokemon. She's been the voice of Ash for the last 15 years. Hi, Sarah. Hello. Can you see me yet? I don't see you. It's still connecting. It's still connecting, it looks like. Okay. Oh. There you <laughs> nice to meet you. How are you doing? You too. I'm doing well. How are you? Good, good. Thank, Thank you so you much for, for me. Yeah, we, well, we're thrilled to talk to you about your career uh, and, and, and Pokemon, of course, which yes. uh, is celebrating a big anniversary this year, the franchise as a whole, celebrating 25 years since the release of the first video game. And of course, you, for the last 15 years, have been the voice of Ash on the English dub of the show. Yes. So I'm curious, working with the character for that long, for that many years, how has your portrayal changed or evolved as he's gone on his Pokemon journey? So it kind of depends on the season. Each arc is about three seasons and he goes through different things in each one. He has different friends, he has different location, he has different things that drive him and motivate him. But fundamentally, I don't, really change who he is and what he stands for. He's a really smart, tenacious, loving, caring kid who just wants to do the right thing while pursuing his dreams. So mm -hmm. that's the place I'm always coming from. And the people who influence him and the situations that influence him kind of guide my performance. But I don't, I don't know what's going to happen before it happens. I don't even read the script before I go into the studio. So. I learn as Ash learns. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And, and you, of course, voice other characters on the show, including a number of Pokemon. And I'm wondering, how do you find the unique voices for those characters, especially with the Pokemon, you know, basically vocally just repeating names? I, yeah, I know. It's hard. It's a lot harder than it sounds. Um, so we look at the Japanese. We, we hear what the Japanese voice did. And sometimes we, we stick close to that. And sometimes we veer away and they let us play and they're like, well, what do you think it sounds like? We get inspired by the animal that it's kind of based on. Um, and we, we learn about their personalities. Like each Pokemon has a very unique personality. So if you listen to the, however many it is, over 20, I believe, Pokemon that I've done, some of them have a very similar voice, but the characterization is different enough, if I do say so myself. And um, you can tell the difference between them. Like they don't necessarily all sound, you know, like yeah. they're even coming from the same place. I hope, I hope that's the hope. <laughs> yeah. And can you talk a little bit more about your process when approaching a character in general and how that maybe changes when you're working on a dub like Pokemon versus a show that's not a dub? So I don't really have a different approach to dubs and uh, original animation. And that might be why I don't look a lot of dubs. <laughs> um, I, I'm a little precious about it. I do feel that uh, the English language is different from, the, uh, from other languages. Our culture is different. And our portrayal of these characters should reflect that because we are serving an English speaking audience as well as an audience that is trying to learn English. There's a lot of that going on too, which is cool. Um, but my approach, I ask, let's talk about auditions. The, the approach to actually doing the job that that's a collaboration with the director. And I have a lot of trust in my Pokemon director, <clears throat> especially. Um, but for an audition, I get the sides. I, 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 I observe the character drawing if it's provided, if it's got a tiny little nose, I might make it a little bit more nasally. 
if if the character is big though i tend to go against type and i don't necessarily give her like this really big voice sometimes i might give her a really small voice and that might really work out well for her you know she might be a little bit in here <laughs> and that might be really funny for a really big lady you know um you try to stay away from stereotypes that's important as a as a russian american i feel that that is important um if you're gonna if you if you have like a buck tooth character you, you might want to go into something like this and and you want to make sure that that guy is really grounded, okay? Because you don't want to play him like, you know, just a stereotype of a guy who talks like that. It's not nice. Um, so there, so I do all that first. I look at the picture. And then I skip, I usually skip the breakdown. And I go straight into the, into the lines. Um, and I read through it a bunch of times. And I try to find all the hints in the actual text. Like, what is this character I want? Um, each line in, in an audition is really important because you got to show everything that that character could go through. Um, so it's important to find out who they're talking to, how they feel about that person, who they're talking about, all the people that that character mentions. I recently had an audition where a character mentions like a bunch of different people and she hates everybody. But she, does, she can't hate everybody equally, right? She has to hate everybody in different ways. She's disgusted by one person, another person, like, treated her badly and she wants to get back at them and that all has to come across in the audition otherwise it's going to sound flat so you make all those choices um let's see let's see uh i get it out a few times and then i go back to the breakdown and i see what i missed and maybe i'm completely off but i'm probably not so <laughs> Um, even even if they give me like a voice reference, I'll, I'll I, I will redo the audition and I'll give them that. And then the tough thing becomes like deciding which one to put first. Do you put the one that they really want first? I heard recently that there are casting directors who want slates that are literally like, "Hi, I'm Sarah Natacheni at A3, and I'm going to do two takes. First one is the one you want. Second one, I'm going to play." I never slated like that in before in my life, but there are some casting directors who want that. So that's part of the process also knowing what everybody wants and serving them. Um, so I'm usually happy with, with what I, what I do originally, but sometimes the breakdown will be like, she loves to belly laugh and I'll be like, damn it. I didn't put a big belly laugh in there. So I do it again. I find all the places early on where you can do a big belly laugh to show that you're paying attention. Um, the first line is very important. If you don't, if you don't show them something good in the first lines, you need to. Have I spoken enough? Do you want more? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of really a little bit with, you know, over the last year, due to the mm -hmm. pandemic, a lot has changed. Uh, we had to adjust a lot. And I'm curious for your audition projects, for, you know, dubbing and your voice work in general, how have you had to change? I, I'm very lonely. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I don't go to the studio anymore. I thankfully have a walk-in closet in my apartment. It's very small, but I got Vocal Booth to go blankets. The producer's choice blankets are fantastic. Um, I, I didn't have a, a really high quality mic before this. Uh, I have a director who let me borrow her Sennheiser 416. Um, let's see, Oralex uh, uh, sent me these phenomenal uh, panels, the Pro Max panels, they're wonderful. They just reflect some sound that I have going on in my booth. And um, yeah, everything's happening over uh, Session Link Pro, Source Connect, uh, Zoom. I had, I just want a testament to these blankets, to the Vocal Booth to Go blankets. I had a commercial session recently and for some reason, my, for the first time ever, my uh, computer wouldn't read my interface would not connect, did not compute. I restarted, still nothing. I'm like, and they're like, you sound fine. What's the problem? And I'm like, that is my, that is my computer mic. What are you talking about, sir? And he's like, no, it's good. So it's more about the space, less about the mic. If you've been worrying, wondering about that, I swear that is true. Mm. Do, so. do you think some of that recording, you know, from home and, and talking to people virtually is gonna stick around for some of your voice work after? That's what everyone is saying. I don't mind. I don't have to go anywhere. The sessions are, you know, it, it, I just pop right in, pop right out. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 
there I'm of two minds group records I'm not happy not happy <laughs> that needs to happen in person there's chemistry there I mean the improv is impossible you're talking over each other you don't you miss things you know the like especially over zoom it has that feature where it like silences the person who spoke first or second I don't know what it is but talking over each other having a rapport is impossible so mm -hmm. yeah I'm sure it'll improve hopefully yeah, yeah. Uh, okay well <laughs> those, are, those are definitely a lot of uh challenges that come with these changes uh, that have taken place during the pandemic mm -hmm. and but going back to your dubbing in general a little bit but still connected to challenges what are some of the challenges of the dubbing process that you wish you'd known when you first started doing it that could be helpful to someone here who's watching who maybe is just starting out sure um the dubbing process, the process itself. I learned how to dub at my audition for Pokemon. <laughs> so mm. it's possible to do. I think I'm an outlier. Um, there, there isn't, I haven't seen a lot of training facilities for dubbing. It's such a specialized skill. That's the thing that I want people to know that Dubbing is such a specialized skill. It's not something everyone can innately do, much less learn. Um, it's a technical skill. You're literally read, you're cold reading while matching to the mouth flaps that are on the screen that you're seeing for the first time. You don't have time to rehearse that. So you have to know how long you have to say that line that you just learned while also giving a believable grounded performance. Mm. So that's acting on top of technical skill, speed. Um, and it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's not as, I, I, I think it's still not as respected as it should be. Um, particularly, it, it's, that's particularly reflected in our rates. Our, our dubbing contract hasn't been updated in 20 years. So mm -hmm. new actors, um, I would say go to codaunite.com, C-O-D-A unite.com. That's um, a national organization of dubbing actors who wholeheartedly support upholding the standards, the rates that exist, the non-union rates that exist. A lot of it is still non-union. Um, the organization has been going on for three years in LA and they've been super successful. Um, union density and dubbing has increased exponentially and I, I hope it will continue to do that. Um, and we hope to uh, re update the uh, contract in the near future get things to reflect the the it, like dubbing has never been as big as it is now it's it's huge now netflix is ordering all these foreign shows and and they've they have the numbers and they've shared them with us and most people prefer dubs to subs so our performances are being heard their dubbing actors are quite famous i think you froze are you there yeah. Yeah. so you know, and the anime thing, I mean, that's just ridiculous because it's so popular and Crunchyroll so to Sony and it's, it's, you know, you go to conventions and there are people lined up around the corner and the fandom is enormous. And I mean, I can get into what we get paid, but I, I don't want to de depress everyone. It's, it's bad. <laughs> yeah. So that's something I think actors should know before they get into it. Don't get into it for the money and always know your rates. Um, GVAA guide the globalvoiceacademy.com. That's, that's a great uh, source of information and codaunite.com. Yeah. Great. And so you, you mentioned how, you know, when you go in for dubbing, you know, you're kind of working on the fly a bit right there, seeing the voices. Yeah. Has there been parts of your training in the past that you find yourself going back to to help in those kind of situations where? Yeah. Uh, improv. For sure. I studied at UCB in magnet theaters in New York and, uh, that yeah, it gives you the con you can't improvise in dubbings uh, pretty much at all um but it gives you the confidence you need to trust yourself to know you can do this you know and that also comes with doing it a lot over and over again obviously you get confidence but improv helps with that mm -hmm. great all right well to just kind of wrap this up is there any other advice for voice actors who are watching today that you would mm -hmm. want to share with them yeah, sure. It's, it's all about who you are and what you do, especially with original animation. And that's how I also approach dubbing. There's a 
piece of me in everything I do. If, if it's not a grounded performance based in your own truth, in your own reality, it's, you're probably not gonna book it, <laughs> especially in animation because things can be so big and so, so broad that if they're not grounded in a reality that's very true to you, it doesn't have to be you, but there's gotta be a piece of it in you, you know, um, or a piece of you in it. Um, that it's not going to be believable to a child who is very, very, um, who gets it, you know, children really, they, they, they know when you're lying, they know. So that's very important to know, to know that you, to know yourself and what you can do. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's great advice. Thank you so much for joining us today to talk about Pokemon in your career okay. and uh, yeah, and thank you everyone who's watching and joining us. And you can find the latest Pokemon Journeys episodes on Netflix. Um, and thank you again, Sarah. Thank you so much. So nice to meet you. You too. All right. Have Take a great care. day. You too. Bye. Bye.